Welcome to the Sunday School lesson for April 14th, 2024. For those of you who are new, I teach Sunday School at Falmouth Baptist Church in Falmouth, Kentucky. And the materials that I use are the Lifeway Sunday School materials, the Bible Studies for Life series. As always, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. So if you would, bow with me. We'll have a word of prayer, then we'll get started. And dear Lord, we just thank you again for allowing us to gather virtually. And Father, I just pray that during this time, your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, lead us and guide us that we might grow closer to you. Father, I lift up any prayer that's on the heart of anyone watching this video. Lord, we just turn that need over to you. And Father, we just pray for those that are struggling with life, those who have lost loved ones, uh, those that are just having a hard time in general. Lord, we just uh, pray that they will find peace and comfort in you. Father, we especially lift up the lost. Father, that they would would hear your Holy Spirit call them, and that they would respond. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want to apologize for those that are regulars. I usually get these up on Friday, but uh, been a lot of circumstances in my life the last couple of days that uh, have put me way behind. So uh, uh, this is the earliest I could get to it. I just got back from taking a family member to the doctor, urgent care this morning, and that's an hour away from where I live, so uh, running way behind. So I apologize. I'll try to stay on top of these a little better, but, you know, life happens. It's not always easy. It's not always perfect, and everything doesn't always go as we plan. So uh, if you're following along in your Bible, so we're reading out of 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and we're starting a new series, a uh, six-week series today uh, entitled Being an Authentic Church. So we're going to be looking at looking at characteristics of, of what is the church, what's an authentic church. And this will be our first lesson with it. The title of our lesson is Built on Christ. And the point of our lesson is everything in the church centers on Jesus Christ. Question of the week, what newsworthy event in your lifetime captured your attention and impacted your life? I thought of a lot of things. <laughs> I'm 67, I've seen a lot uh, over the years. Uh, seen a lot of things that impacted my life over the years uh, that affected it one way or another. And I, I'm sure no matter what age you are, we all have those moments in our life that that uh, something happens and we see it on the news and it affects us directly. Um, in the materials, the, the author talks about and looks back to April 15th of 2019. If you look back at that date, that's the date that Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris was on fire. And I remember watching that. It was all over the news, live coverage of the fire of this great, famous, massive cathedral. Um, and, you know, it was just something that caught the attention of the world, if you will. And it remained the attention for quite some time. Six days later, though, there were terrorists in Sri Lanka. And on Easter, they attacked a number of churches. They attacked hotels. You know, uh, it, it wasn't just churches, but there were a number of places, but but a lot of the attacks were on churches, and they think it was because of the celebration of Easter. And 321 adults and children were killed in those attacks. It made the news then, but then you never heard anything more about it. You know, so our question today is we think of the church. What do we think of when we think of the church? Is it a building like the cathedral in Paris or is it the people? You know, what truly is the church? Um, and Jesus did not give his life to give us supplies to build a building. He gave his life to create a people. So that should tell you that the tone of this lesson. And anyway, in any event, as I say, we're reading out of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. A little bit of background. Peter wrote this, this uh, letter uh, while he was in Rome uh, around AD 60, and he wrote it to the churches that are in what's modern-day Turkey. Um, and, you know, he was encouraging Christians to stand firm despite their persecutions. So chapter 2 that we're reading out of today stresses that abiding in Christ as the source of the of holy living for the people of God, for the church. So I'm going to read the verses again, 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 12. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the world, of the word, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation, 
if you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe. But for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone and the stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word and they were destined for this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. So, as I say, it's a, a written um, by Peter to the early church in Turkey. And as we start out, um, we have to sort of look at the verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 25. And in that time, in those verses, Peter issues a command or a call to to holy living, you know, a lifestyle in in obedience, in obedience to Christ. So he's he's just delivered that call and command to the people. So then in chapter two, it starts out, he says, therefore. So basically, given everything I've told you about holy living, here's some things that are important. Um, he says, therefore, you know, there are certain things that we must do that lead to a lifestyle of obedience in Christ. And he starts out by listing five sins that fracture or tear apart churches. And he says, rid yourselves of these things. He says, rid yourself of all malice, you know, attributes or actions that inflict harm upon others. Rid yourself of all deceit, you know, fraud, untruthfulness. Rid yourself of all of hypocrisy, you know, pretending to be something you're not, you know, something that's contrary to your real purposes. Don't pretend to be the church. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, I hate to say it out there, but, you know, False preachers, false uh, leaders that they're in it for ulterior motives. They're in it for themselves. He says, rid yourself of that hypocrisy. Uh, you know, it's also about living your life, you know, living your a lifestyle it lives up to the words you're, you're saying. But just get rid of the hypocrisy. Rid yourself of envy. You know, those attitudes of self-interest, those things that you look for yourself at the expense of others. And then finally he says, rid yourself of slander. You know, speaking evil about others, backbiting, um, you know, defamation, you know, just talking bad about people. Uh, I don't know how many times over the years I used to work with youth and sometimes the the church would go on a little trip and there'd be a mixture of youth and adults, uh, you know, on the church bus. So we went out maybe singing Christmas carols or something. And sometimes get the youth and some of the kids would say, why did so-and-so talk so mean about such and so, someone else in the church? You know, they heard it. Uh, Peter says, get rid of that stuff. You know, that's something that will tear a church apart. And in verse two, he, he changes. He says, instead, he says, desire the pure milk of the word. You know, crave that which enables believers to grow in their faith. You know, that will grow in your faith. Crave that, the word of God. He says, crave the word of God. He says, grow up into your salvation. You know, it's a lifelong journey, a lifelong, uh, you know, process of sanctification, you know, growing in your faith. He says, crave that. And he says, if, or since you've been saved, you know, you have to, you have, you've tasted the goodness of God because you've been saved. And so you should crave that. And as you come to him, he says, having, you know, put, repented and put your faith in Christ, he says, be a living stone, you know, being that solid, unmovable foundation of the church, of the building, of the body. Um, he says, you know, be that that stone that was rejected by the people, you know, re, re, the religious leaders. He said, but you are chosen and honored by God. You know, we're chosen, we're valued by God as part of the church. Again, not, not the brick building or the wood building or the shed or wherever building or structure you're worshiping. 
the church, the people. He says, you know, be a living stone in that, uh, in, in a spiritual house. You know, again, the body of Christ being the church. And he also says, you're a holy priesthood. You know, you're holy. You're set apart for a purpose if you're involved in a church. He says you should be offering spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, following the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life, offering those spiritual sacrifices in response to what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, you know, the, the salvation that he has granted us. We should be willing to, to sacrifice, uh, whether it's our time, our, our gifts, certainly, you know, whatever. We should be willing to sacrifice, make those spiritual sacrifices. And then we jump on over to verses 6 through 8, the next set of verses in our, our passages. And, and here we see, you know, that God builds the true church on no other foundation than Jesus Christ. He says it stands in Scripture. Peter says, you know, God's word is forever relevant. It's permanent. It was good when he was talking about the Old Testament times when Peter was talking to them his time. It's still there for us today. It stands in Scripture. And he says, see, I lay, behold, you know, God is getting ready to do something. See, I lay a stone, you know, and the stone, a specific stone is the foundation of a building, especially in that time where they would lay that stone. And once you laid that main stone, that cornerstone, all the others went from it. You know, it's true today. You know, we maybe don't lay a cornerstone necessarily in, in a lot of buildings, but when that foundation is laid, how it's laid affects everything else. You know, it's the one that's that's laid that stone. And he says that stone that's chosen and honored by God. You know, again, the foundation, the cornerstone, the stone where all other stones, you know, are, you know, from that position on, it's the foundational portion of the building. That same Greek word for cornerstone is often translated as capstone as well, which is uh, the part of the top of the arch, that last stone is put in place to keep the arch in place or the, the, the structure in place. So it's kind of interesting that word at the co for cornerstone and capstone, the same word, the beginning and the completion, all of it, you know, through Jesus Christ, it says, you know, you know, that we are the complete that, uh, that, that church. Uh, I'm, I'm stumbling here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and he says, the one who believes, the one who f follows Jesus will never be put to shame. You know, at the end of times in judgment, you'll never be put to shame if you're a believer. He said, instead, God will honor believers. He says, but for the unbelieving, for the unbelieving, only judgment and condemnation for sins awaits them. He says, those that reject Christ, you know, and he refers back to Psalms 118, those, the stone that the builders rejected, the ones that reject Christ face judgment, you know, and condemnation for their sins. He says, for the unbelieving, you know, Christ becomes a stone, you know, to stumble over, a rock to trip over. Unbelievers will stumble and fall because they reject God's fullest revelation of himself through Jesus Christ. And as a result of their disobedience, they will disobey the word. Uh, disobedience is the result of unbelief for the unbelievers. You know? And it says they are destined. You know, they're destined for an eternal separation from God. Then we move into the last set of verses, uh, verses 9 through 12. Peter changes his focus from the unbelievers back to the believers. He starts off by saying, but you. And then he gives four descriptions or titles for unbelievers. He says, but you, he says, you are a chosen race. You know, and here he's talking about all believers, both Jew and Gentile. The Jews were the God's chosen people. They were the people through whom God would send the Messiah. That's how they were the chosen people. Now, though, the Messiah has come. And now he says, you know, you are a chosen race. All who believe, not just the Jews, but Jew and Gentile alike are a chosen race. And he says, you are a royal priesthood. You know, you are to proclaim the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. If you're part of the church, you have that duty. And he says, we are a holy nation. You know, again, that word holy means set apart. You know, we're set apart by God, again, to proclaim the gospel, gospel and to glorify God. And finally, he says, you know, you are a people for his possession. We belong to God. You know, Peter says that you belong to God. Once you are saved, once you're a Christian, you are saved. And then he says, why? 
Yeah, I, I ask that question. Why? Why as a church? You know, why are we saved? What? Why are we separated? And, you know, a holy possession of God, he says. And then Peter says, so that you may proclaim the praises. You know, it's the duty of every Christian to proclaim, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called us out of darkness, you know, called us out of the darkness of sin and into his marvelous light. While we walk in sin, you know, we walk in darkness. When we're saved, we're in the light of the Lord. He says, he called you out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. And in verse 10, he says, now we are God's people, you know, that have received mercy through the gift of salvation. He said, before you were saved, you did not have mercy. Now you have received mercy. Then he, he sort of again sort of shifts gears and he, he starts addressing to the people. He says, he calls us dear friends or that can also be as, translated as beloved. You know, he says, you are strangers and exiles of the world. Um, you know, your allegiance is now to God. It's not to worldly things. As part of the church, you have an allegiance that is different than, than the rest of the world. So you become strangers and exiles from the world. And he says, we are to abstain from sinful desires. If you're a Christian, you know, abstain from those desires that are sinful. It doesn't say abstain from all desires, but abstain from sinful desires. Those things that run counter to God's word. He says those things, and he uses the phrase, that wage war with the soul. Those things that, you know, that, that would separate us from God. We are to abstain from them. In verse 12, though, he says, instead, he says, we are to act honorably. You know, our, our actions should be morally good. They should be virtuous. He says, instead, act honorably. And it's kind of interesting here. He says, among the Gentiles. And here that word Gentiles basically means among the unbelievers, among the people of the world that are out there, that are watching you. He says, act honorably. Because why? He says, so that when they slander you, they're going to talk about you as a Christian. They're going to call you a, a Jesus freak, a crackpot, you know, a religious nut, uh, you know, foolish you're not enlightened if you're a follower. You know, you don't have that knowledge that we have here in the world. Um, he says, those people are going to slander you, but he says, act honorably, act morally virtuous. And why? He says, you know, the truth of our actions will overshadow that slander uh, as unbelievers. He says, as the unbelievers observe your good works. You know, if you act in an upright manner, no matter what they say about it, if people see you, and see the truth in your life. See that your actions are consistent with what God would have you to do. It speaks to them. It is a witness to them. So our actions should be honorable, you know, so that the evidence is there, that they see that in our lives as a church. And that is hard. But, you know, I, I can really relate to that because I was not a Christian until I was 27 years old. And one of the things that kept me away from church, frankly, was church people. And the way I saw them act in the world, the kids that I went to high school with, some of them, and college with, and the way they act. They went to church every Sunday, but boy, during the week, <laughs> you could see they needed church. Um, you know, he says, we should be different so that when people see us, you know, they'll see the good works. They will see our faith in action. And he says, you know, let our actions glorify God. You know, we should live differently because Christ has made us to be different. You know, the world needs to see a different path. When they are looking at different things in life, when people are looking at different paths that can be chosen in life, the world needs to see a different path, a path that leads to salvation. You know, we should glorify God with our lives so that others may someday do the same. So again, I'm going to wrap up there. I'm Apologize if I'm a little disjointed today. It has been a long, long day. Uh, Thursday night, I got maybe an hour sleep, if that much. So I, hopefully next week I'll be in better shape. But, you know, Lord willing, I'll get it back and I'll be back and have a, a lesson back up on Friday um, as usual. But, you know, my prayer this week is that, that we'll all take to heart and read that those passages in Peter and see you know, what God calls us to do, how he calls us to be different and demonstrate to the world that the church is more than just brick and mortar, more than just 
wood and nails, but it is the people. It is God's people. So pray that you have a blessed week. Lord willing, be back next week with another lesson. <laughs>